Our next speaker has made significant strides in the field of education. Since 2016, she has been both an assistant professor for graduate and undergraduate students at Butler's University of College of Education. Prior to her work at Butler, she was an assistant professor at Marion University, where she founded the Educational Neuroscience Symposium. Her work has been pivotal in the use of neuroscience and education. Her passion is engaging her students through social and relational neurosciences and then applying those practices to her educational practices. I apologize. <laughs> Please join us in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Lloyd DeSantos. Thank you. It is such an honor um, to be sitting beside all of you this morning. And as my PowerPoint is going to be pulled up here hopefully in a moment, um, I want to think about behavior. If you could define behavior, what would that be? How would you define behavior? This is what I study. I want you to take a look at this body of water. We really don't see much here other than an aerial view of the beautiful blue surface. We don't know how it came to be. We don't know how it evolved. We're not sure of the environment that supports it. We see just an image that we don't understand and we don't really take in. This is what we're going to be talking about today. The title is Diving Beneath Behaviors, A Journey Through Our Nervous Systems. A behavior is something that a person does that can be observed, it can be repeated, it can be assessed. But there's so much more. I work in the schools two days a week, and I want to share this definition that came to me after I left my fifth grade class. So I'm teaching graduate students at Butler. I'm traveling around the world integrating applied educational neuroscience. But the most important work I do is in the K through 12 or pre-K through 12 classroom. And I want to read this to you because this is really what we miss. We miss the mark here. A child's behavior isn't about me. They're not doing this to me. It's a symptom, like a sneeze showing us a cold, a cut with a wound, or a scab showing us healing. This behavior is showing us that the nervous system is rough. Can we become curious? Can we reach beneath that behavior? This is my lab. At Butler University, my lab is the classroom. I am a practitioner. I take the research and study human teacher and student behavior. And I begin with my own behavior. And I so wish I would have known this as a young mom, as a young teacher. What I'm going to talk about for the next 15 minutes is as much about me personally as it is professionally. And I hope you can come away from these next few minutes thinking about the power of your nervous system. This is Crystal Williams. We, I taught at Belzer Middle School in Indianapolis with her during the pandemic years, along with Lori Kirkland. I go in two mornings or two afternoons a week, and I take the research, and I'm going to share some of the practices with you this morning um, that we can integrate in our homes and in our schools and our organizations. And, and this is reaching beneath the behavior and getting out in front of the behavior. This is the classroom I entered in January, this January, and I left them last week. I got to be in there after lunch, in the afternoons, two days a week. And I'm going to tell you, it was one of the roughest classes I have ever experienced. But they learned about their nervous systems in complex ways. This is Miles, my very first grandson. And I share this image because I get a do-over as a grandmother. 
I get to watch his behavior, reach beneath the behavior, sit beside my daughter. And I, I, I get to observe and integrate ways that I was unaware of as a young mom when we think about the developing brain and body of our nervous systems. This is the applied educational neuroscience framework. And I'm going to focus over the next few minutes on that fourth tree. You can see the leaves turning. And it's called the language of the nervous system as we dive beneath behavior. So I want you to think of your role as a parent, as a caregiver, as an educator, as an aunt. Whatever that role is as you sit beside children, we think about our nervous systems, co-regulation, the magic of touch points, and then reaching beneath the behavior for the language of the nervous system. So last Tuesday, I celebrated with my fifth grade students. And we learned deeply over the last four months, and I'm going to share some of the practices that we integrated and that I take into schools across the world. This is, a, this is the work, this picture, this image. We studied the brain and the nervous system. Those are sheep brains in the bucket. So we were studying the sheep brains from the Carolina Science Store because anatomically, a sheep brain looks like our brain. So rather than talking about anger or talking about oppositional, defiant, disrespectful, um, entitled behaviors, we talked about what's happening in the cortex, in the amygdala, and in the brain stem. These kids learned why they feel the way they feel, and they felt empowered, and they felt relieved. So we revisited our human laboratory last week on my last day with them. Just to share with you a little of the science, we come into the world with this brain stem. It's around 500 million years old. And it's the seat of survival. It's where we do everything without thinking about it consciously. It's where our digestion happens. It's respiration. It's where we have sleep rhythms. And it's also where our stress response systems get activated. So when I hear something or there is something that feels threatening or unfamiliar to me, my heart starts to beat. And that starts in that reptilian brainstem. It's really the CEO, the conductor of all of the functions, what we call regulatory functions in the brain. So when your heart starts to beat fast, when your mouth gets dry, when you sweat, when you start to shiver because you're cold, that's all because of that reptilian brain. But it also fires up when we feel dysregulated and it's functioning beneath the behavior, those behaviors that we misunderstand. The, the limbic system, right here above your ears, there are two almond-shaped clusters of neurons called the amygdala. And that's our brain's smoke detector. It's our fire alarm. And when it is firing, it shuts down the cortex. So many of our children today come into our schools, adolescents come into our schools with these labels, emotionally disturbed, behavior disordered, you know, attention deficit. You know, and then we have labels of depression and anxiety. And I'm glad we can identify those, but there's so much more than the labels and the classifications, and I want to speak to those for just a couple more minutes. This slide, my students love, and they get this. To the left is a cortex that is turned on, it's fired up, and we can think clearly, we can reason, we can be logical, we can pause before we say something we regret, we can have good, strong working memory and sustained attention. And it's sending projections all the way through the nervous system. But on the right is reddened area in the limbic system where the amygdala is. Until a few decades ago, we thought that the brain was immune to inflammation. And now we know that when there is excessive cortisol, you've heard of cortisol, that stress hormone. When there is excessive adrenaline, it wreaks havoc on brain tissue. So our students walk into our classrooms and they track the state of their nervous system. When I'm in the green, I'm feeling safe and connected. 
when I am feeling irritated, annoyed, angry, I can literally put a tracker there and let my teacher, let the adult know, you know, where I am in my nervous system, autonomic nervous system state, or I may be living in that brainstem area we call shutdown. It's much more than freeze. This is a dissociative, dissociative disconnected state. So each of our nervous system states that are always communicating with the body have their own story. When you are feeling in a state of felt safety, your story is your story of connection. When you are feeling rough, as we say in our house, dysregulated, your body, the blood, the oxygen flow starts to move into that limbic area. And I'm being very schematic. The brain doesn't work in sections or regions. But for us, it does today. So you move into that story of protection. And then when you feel overwhelmed and you can't run from your stressor or fight off your stressor, you literally begin to disconnect from the world around you and you disconnect from yourself. So I'm going to share with you what our little kids and children know, but we have been conditioned out of this word. And the word is sensation. When we are born, our identity is sensation. But as adults, our heads go one way and our bodies go the other. And we are teaching our children the language of the nervous system, which is the most powerful, critical aspect of mental and emotional health. Sensations, which I'm going to share examples, you experience all the time. I just, I just share a couple of these examples. Driving down the road and you hear that screeching brake sound and that car zooms past you, missing your side of the car by an inch. And what do you experience? Tingling, a rush of energy. That's a sensation. A loud noise awakens you from a deep sleep in the middle of the night. What's a sensation? Your heart is beating quickly. You feel fast. You feel maybe a little numb. You just received the best news, and you feel your heart beating fast with excitement. You feel a bit jittery. You have that, what we call in our house, that icky, yucky Sunday night feeling before work or school on Monday morning. And you feel that lump in your throat, and you feel that tension and tightness in the body. And then you have the biggest crush on this person, and they look your way and smile, and you get gooey. These are what my middle school students tell me, and warm and hot. And those are sensation words. This is a sensation word wall. Take a look at how different these are than feeling words. I might be feeling teary or tired or tight. I might be experiencing itchiness, edginess, prickly, rough. Those are physicalized feelings that our two and three and four-year-olds get. They've not been conditioned out of their bodies. They can tell us how they experience their external world, their internal world, and their relational world. So we create sensation word walls and sensation word jars. Every home should have one of these. Our classroom should have these. And our students draw their sensations. They give their sensations lines and colors and shapes. When we teach ourselves about the language of the nervous system, we begin to reach beneath the behavior. We might call a student violent or aggressive, but in that nervous system, there is some stuckness, some numbness. There's hollowness. And, and I know it's hard to read those words, but this is reaching for the root of behavior. Behavior management, as a mom, as a grandmother, as a teacher, centers on the adult. A dysregulated adult can never regulate a child. Never. We can get compliance and obedience, but we don't get that sustainable emotional and mental 
shift that brings states of relaxed alertness. This is a poster in our new manual that's coming out this summer because this work, when we talk about the behaviors of students and our own children, begins with us. I've got to take care of my own nervous system before I can attend and attune to a child or adolescence. Let's celebrate our nervous systems. This is our adolescent poster. Not just normalize those sensations, but celebrate that our nervous system always knows how to get home. And this is our children's poster. So they can begin to identify how they're experiencing a condition, an event, another person, or the environment. I'm gonna skip that one for now because I'm running out of time. This is our human laboratory. And we brought in the physician jackets, the goggles, and the gloves, because this is the work. We spend 10 to 20 minutes every day in our human laboratory, peeling back the layers of uncomfortable and often misunderstood behaviors. In that lab, our students learn that the body and the brain are constantly communicating. This is a bi-directional highway, and we've lost that as adults. In our lab, we look at this image and we wonder, what is this child or adolescent experiencing? Look at the sensations. There's heat in the head and there's ice in the limbs. That's what we would call a very tonic, fast, heart beating fast, but feeling stuck and overwhelmed. This is a sixth grade student who shared with us that right before he popped off and he was having five and six and seven fights a day, right before he spazzed, he said, I would hear a buzzing in my ears, my hands would get red and hot, and I felt like my feet couldn't stand still, they were like lightning, and he drew this to share, and over an entire school year, he began to recognize the sensations, and he would go to the gym and shoot baskets before he popped off and before he spazzed because he was learning and listening to the language of his nervous system. Discipline is relational. We missed the mark there. Discipline is about the adult nervous system. Discipline is preventative and discipline is nervous system aligned when we reach for. So this talk this morning has been about the most important conversation you can have with anyone, and that is the conversation with your own nervous system. When you listen to your body, your brain responds with the resources you need so that we can get to the cortex and we can learn well, parent well, teach well, and lead well. Thank you so much.